My name is Dr. Jonathan Toon, and today is April 28th, uh, 2014, and it is my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Feigl. Um, we're in the Senior Physiologist Lounge at the um, Experimental Biology meeting. Um, we'll talk to Dr. Feigl today as part of the, the uh, APS uh, Living History, uh, Living Legacy um, interview series. Um, so, Dr. Feigl, tell me about yourself and your upbringing. Well, I was born in Iowa City and grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm the son of a very prominent philosopher, Herbert Feigl, who was a member of the Vienna Circle and a philosopher of science. I uh, went to medical school at the University of Washington, excuse me, the <laughs> University of Minnesota, uh, <coughs> and interned at Philadelphia General Hospital and did uh, postdoctoral work uh, in several places, most notably in Sweden, with my most important uh, teacher, Bjorn Folkhoff. Uh, I served my military service in the U.S. Public Service uh, at NIH as a research associate in the National Heart Institute. Um, so tell me about your work with, with uh, Dr. Folkhoff, you said. Right. Well, uh, Bjorn Folkhoff taught me uh, about uh, uh, thinking through problems uh, in, in a mechanistic way. Uh, he was a very uh, ingenious thinker in the sense that he uh, knew uh, a lot of physiology in, in many ways uh, and loved to extrapolate. Uh, from my father's influence, uh, I extrapolate a little less than Bjorn Folkhoff does. So what work did you do with him? Uh, we did uh, interesting work on the diving reflex, which is not what I'm known for. Right. Uh, and after that, I went to NIH and really started uh, cardiovascular work uh, on mechanics. Um, so. Um Tell me about your early academic training after, after your work there in, in, in NIH. Okay, well, I, I started as an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania and began uh, work on the coronary circulation, which is what we're going to talk about. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I see that it, during this uh, time and throughout your career that you've, you've won numerous awards. Um, you received the Research Career Development Award from NIH. Um, you won the first annual CATS Prize from the American Heart Association, um, Outstanding Research Award from the International Society of Heart Research. Um, you won the Carl Wiggers Award for Cardiovascular Research from the APS, um, the John Shepard uh, Lecture Award, and also the Byrne Distinguished Lectureship. So it's quite a number of accomplishments. Yes, well, of course, the uh, American Physiological Society has been a good home to me, and and uh, as, uh, I'm pleased to have gotten some of those awards from that. Um, so tell me about your early research and, and your first faculty appointment where you said you became really interested in coronary circulation. Well, that was at, at UPenn, and uh, the first question uh, was the autonomic control of the coronary circulation. And following uh, Bjorn Folkhoff, who described uh, with Uvnus uh, the defense reaction, uh, the question was whether sympathetic cholinergic fibers innervate the coronary circulation. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, those fibers are found in skeletal muscle in dogs and cats, not found in humans, uh, and not uh, innervating the coronary. Uh, but as part of that, we found the alpha vasoconstriction, alpha adrenoceptor mediated vasoconstriction in the coronary circulation, which led to a lot of papers uh, along the way. Uh, that was very controversial at the time because it's uh, activated during exercise, and why would there be a vasoconstrictor influence during exercise? Uh, it seemed counterintuitive, uh, and it's been demonstrated in many ways in, uh, uh, since then. Uh, the current hypothesis that I have is that it uh, helps with the distribution of coronary blood flow across the left ventricular wall. Um, 
Myocardial ischemia begins in the inner layer of the left ventricle, and at very high heart rates, uh, it gets compromised, and it appears that the alpha constriction somehow compensates for the uh, uh, compressive forces that are in the heart, uh, so that uh, the inner layer flow is uh, sustained. But this is only important uh, when the heart rate is very high, when contractility is very high, and when myocardial oxygen consumption is high. If it's looked for under resting conditions, the period of diastole is long enough so that it's not important uh, because flow to the inner layer of the left ventricle is diastole or indiastole. So, so this is work that followed you throughout your entire career that started? Right. right. We can go on then to paras parasympathetic. Yes, which, which happened at the same. Right, and, and parasympathetic control uh, is, is one of the work that I got a prize for. was often uh, very confusing because if parasympathetic discharge goes to uh, the heart, then the heart rate slows. Uh, and because of that and local metabolic factors, coronary blood flow goes down. Uh, and the uh, maneuver that we used was to pace the heart at a constant rate and then stimulate the vagus and, and coronary blood flow goes up. Uh, it's a very simple maneuver uh, that hadn't been thought of before, albeit that the question had been debated for a couple of decades. Uh, the parasympathetic dilation is blocked by atropine. Uh, so that's a necessary point in, in demonstrating that. And that led to a series of papers where we demonstrated that there is parasympathetic cholinergic vasodilation in the coronary circulation during carotid sinus reflexes, during carotid uh, uh, chemoreceptor reflexes, and uh, during the betzold yaris reflex. Uh, and th those were, tell me about those studies, there were some elegant studies there where you isolated the, the carotid sinus and perfused and pressurized and to right. describe this reflex. A graduate student, Bruce Ito, was the uh, first author on those papers and he was very clever in, in, in doing those. Uh, and we also involved uh, pacing in some of those experiments as well. Uh, the isolated uh, carotid sinus, carotid body uh, preparation uh, was not original with us, but involved uh, complicated pumps to keep the, the brain and the rest of the animal alive while we perfused the, uh, the heart uh, through the aorta. And, and this, this led subsequently to the development of uh, or your honing of the closed chest uh, coronary preparation? Uh, well, yes, that, that's an interesting story. Uh, I was taught the cannulation of the coronary arteries closed chest via the carotid artery by uh, a visitor who came from the Ukraine, Anastas Ivanovich Homozuk, who taught me that technique uh, in which we uh, amplified uh, as well. And it was very useful in, in the sense that in an anesthetized animal, one could measure coronary blood flow or perfuse the coronary circulation with uh, out opening the chest, which is a nice advantage for experimental work. Uh, so this was work you ended up doing at University of Washington. So what, what led you to leave UPenn and, and travel to Seattle? Well, uh, uh, that's uh, always a long story, but the, the, the better opportunity in Seattle, it was a, a very strong department at the time. Uh, and uh, the lure of the mountains. Uh, uh, I, I'm an avid skier and a ski mountaineer, and the mountains are right out my window in, in Seattle, so it was irresistible. Right, and you've stayed there ever since. That you came, went to uh, University of Washington in 1969. That's right, right? and and still there today. Right. <laughs> um, so once developing this and moving to Washington, you, you continued with the autonomic control, but also began uh, studies with metabolic control. That's right. And, and uh, uh, that, the, the hypothesis at the time 
was the adenosine hypothesis of Bob Byrne. And uh, we and many others uh, tested the adenosine hypothesis over many decades. And the big difficulty was to be able to measure adenosine in the interstitial fluid. Uh, and there were various attempts, which I'm not going to go through, which uh, made it very difficult. Uh, one could measure adenosine in the coronary venous blood, or could measure it in the arterial blood, but how do you get an interstitial measurement? And there were various approaches. One notable one was a student, Keith Kroll, who cannulated the lymphatic vessels of the heart and measured adenosine in the lymphatic drainage of the heart. And that, and many other negative studies, uh, defeated the adenosine hypothesis with some caveats. First of all, Byrne's first experiment on adenosine was that he made cat hearts hypoxic and measured adenosine coming out of the perfused heart uh, and found adenosine. A and that observation has held up to this day. Hypoxic or ischemic myocardium releases adenosine. But under physiological circumstances, for example, during exercise, adenosine is not the physiological vasodilator. It is uh, a pathophysiological dilator. And when myocardium gets hypoxic, it releases adenosine, but it also releases lactic acid and ATP and many other uh, dilators, potassium, and so on. So it's important to distinguish between the pathophysiological and physiological regulators on this point. So there are many studies in, in examination of this. You mentioned some by Dr. Kroll and in step in development of the model, and then there were other studies which followed. That's right, <laughs> including <laughs> some, some by you. Self-serving, that's okay. <laughs> uh, which which was, uh, they were finally definitive uh, in the sense that we were able to uh, determine the interstitial uh, adenosine uh, in exercising animals, actually, following the work of, of Kroll and, and others, uh, uh, where from a measurement of arterial and venous adenosine and flow uh, with a, a, a diffusion molecule, a model, excuse me, one could take uh, account the uh, interstitial. So I think that your paper was sort of the last nail in the coffin <laughs> for physiological control and it was an elegant study with exercising dogs. And in parallel, there were also many studies that continued the, the autonomic control uh, sure. examination of that hypothesis as well. But well, we talked about uh, uh, parasympathetic and, and, and sympathetic. Uh, I, I, I think that, that the uh, uh, major thing is that uh, we got to the beta receptor uh, autonomic control. And uh, the way that that works is that uh, when uh, an animal or a human exercises, there is sympathetic discharge to the heart, which goes to the pacemaker, it increases heart rate, goes to the myocardium and uh, increases contractility. Uh, and uh, to the coronary vessels, which causes a beta adrenal, adrenoceptor dilation. Uh, and when that's blocked, then the flow doesn't go as, as much, and oxygen extraction uh, increases. Again, you're a major player on those <laughs> studies. Um, but that was quite a complex uh, set of studies, right, that led to, to to uh, examination of this hypothesis, right, due to the sort of multiple inputs and... Right, and, and, and that's a problem uh, in studying the coronary circulation in the sense that uh, the heart perfuses itself and, and anything that compromises the heart compromises the coronary circulation and vice versa. And of course, we're all aware that a compromise of coronary circulation leads to a myocardial infarction and decreased cardiac pumping, uh, and so the circle comes around. Right. 
But with that said, you've also had an interest in coronary pressure flow autoregulation as well? Uh, yes, we've looked at that. Uh, I don't think that we've uh, uh, gotten any great positive insights. We've found some things that don't work. Um, and which leads us to, to more recent studies with the, uh, the ATP hypothesis. Yeah, well, that's the current hypothesis. It's based on the work of Mary Ellsworth and colleagues where uh, red cells, when they get in a low oxygen environment, release a little bit of ATP through uh, panexin channels. Uh, there's a signaling cascade from inside the red cell which allows uh, the ATP just a little bit to come out of red cells. And that acts on purinergic receptors uh, on the uh, receptors in the circulation. We're now not talking about interstitial ATP, but intravascular ATP from the red cell. And uh, when that's blocked, then coronary blood flow doesn't go up as much as uh, in the unblocked situation. So that's a um, new hypothesis where the saturation of hemoglobin, which is the stimulus for the release of ATP from red cells, is the regulated variable in a feedback control. And initially, we didn't use the words feedback and feed forward. Uh, so the feed forward mechanisms are the sympathetic and parasympathetic that I've described. And the feedback, the current hypothesis, is uh, the adenosine triphosphate ATP. Uh, the adenosine hypothesis that uh, Byrne was a feedback hypothesis. He also didn't use those words uh, uh, in those era. Uh, those are engineering terms which we've adopted in biology. And, and so thinking of control mechanisms has evolved significantly from, from the time of burn, right, with feedback control to, to now and, and exactly what the controller may be, right? Yes. Well, the current hypothesis is that the controller is uh, ATP and its breakdown products, ADP and AMP, in the coronary circulation. Uh, that acts on the purinergic receptors that I mentioned, uh, and then that results in a conducted response, uh, the work of Siegel and Dooling, uh, showing that there's a conducted response which goes from the microvasculature retrograde up to the arteriole to cause dilation. Uh, and it, it's a scheme that works very well uh, when we test it. Uh, it's new enough that nobody has really tested it uh, independently. So I, I have to ask you about your, what, what I consider to be your most seminal work, and that is your 1983 review that you wrote for Physiologic Reviews. Yeah, well, that, that took me a long time, as you, you know, <laughs> and, and had uh, uh, 1,500 references. Uh, and this was done at a time when we didn't have very much computer assistance in managing references. Uh, and. Uh, printing uh, uh, bibliographic reference lists. So uh, it took us a long time to gather that all together, and everything was done on, on paper. Yeah, that, that, it's such an important work that, that I remember using as a student and a postdoc, and even today, and my students still, still refer to this as sort of the Bible of coronary physiology. So it's well, I'm, I'm, I'm not very religious. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's a Bible, and of course it's quite old now, uh, but I'm honored that people still look at it. it it's, it's quite a reference and quite an achievement that's been cited thousands and thousands of times, and, and, um, but it's, you know, as, as a historic document, I think it's, it's fantastic. And, um, so, you know, you've seen things change significantly over your career. What, what advice do you have for, for young students that are, are, are starting out today and just getting involved in science and physiology research? Well, I would say have a testable hypothesis. Uh, the other is 
make the experiment as simple as possible. Just because something can be measured, don't add it on. And that's the danger now with uh, teamwork, uh, uh, which is necessary in, in, uh, in the modern era. And that is that you're collaborating with somebody and they're going to help you with a measurement, but they can also measure X, Y, Z. Well, by the time you've collected all those samples and arranged for that in, in the experiment, things tend to go wrong. Uh, and so the more variables that you measure, the more chance for failure. So what you're telling me is too much is too much and too little is too little. Yeah, that's a <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an old old slogan around the lab that that we repeat it. Uh, the other thing that I would say is uh, that uh, in addition to simplifying experiments, but not too simple, uh, is to uh, simplify life. Uh, it's more important to worry about the science than to worry about one's career. Um, it's ego boosting to accept every invitation to talk and travel uh, and uh, to, in some sense, polish one's CV. But in the end, it's the science that you do that will be most rewarding and in professionally more rewarding <laughs> than a long list of lectures and invited talks and so on and so forth. Now, some of that needs to be done, uh, of course, uh, for young people to advance, but it can be overdone. Um, and you've had numerous trainees, my, myself included, but, but over the years that, that have gone on to do very prominent, prominent work. You've mentioned a few, or there um, other work from, uh, from others that that you would like to, to discuss? Well, that, that's a long list and I'm not going to go through, go through it, but I'm, of course, in, indebted to the postdocs and, and colleagues and, and, and students uh, who uh, did a lot of, a lot of the work. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, well, what did you think about it? I, it was a phenomenal experience for me in, in, in uh, working in your lab. Um, and, and as you said, rigorous hypothesis testing, um, managing the experiments, not doing too much, but doing enough to, to address the hypothesis. Um, and, um, and the fact that, that you were in the lab uh, running experiments with us, not as the overarching uh, professor who was mandating things, but as a, a member of the team. And, and I still try to do this with my students and postdocs today of working with them in the lab to, to run experiments and to, to analyze data and make sure. Um, I always remember we would do an experiment and about three o'clock in the afternoon you would come in and, and, and prod me to, to, see the, to see the data. So this was a constant reminder to stay on top of, of analyzing experiments. So every day we would not only do the experiment but analyze the data, have it together uh, and ready to go, and that's something I, I continue today as, as I train students and, and postdocs. So um, I mean, there, there are a number of us that are indebted to you for your, for your help and training and, and oversight. And not only that, that you've continued to, to follow us and the, the, the phone call to check up, how are you doing? How's your family? How are you, know, just, just checking up, and that means that, that has meant a lot. Yeah. Well, we should probably bring this to a close because you and I have a little uh, discussion. Yes, going. but we'll continue <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on how continue to make our, an interpret yes. interpretation. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Feigl.